Johannes Garbino Anton from the company Nex, because we are now turning from the ecosystem which we need for EV tolls flying to how these EV tolls can be powered and which kind of EV tolls are flying. Do we only have aircraft like the Volocopter, which is a, a um, um, like the Volo City, let's say the Volo City, which is a multi-copter, uh, can fly only short distances, especially with battery. Will we have lift and cruise, a tilt rotor aircraft, which can fly a bit further, or will we have some other energy source, which will make it possible that uh, we fly even further? And uh, on this field, uh, next arrow is working and johannes he worked for some of the companies we had before he worked for dlr as a test pilot he is an aeronautical engineer and i don't want to steal your time of your presentation so uh, let's see if you can share your screen and uh, then the i would leave the stage for you and i already put off my camera let's see yes screen is coming uh, not presentation mode and let's see okay is it yeah, in full screen mode now mode, that's perfect i leave you awesome. the stage really Welcome thank you very much on um, the e-flight forum 2022 thank you very much um good morning everyone yeah i'm i'm glad that uh, we have the chance to present our project we we are next and we are uh, looking at uh, kind of the first dedicated uh, hydrogen eVTOL uh, design. Um, well, in, in this forum, I guess I don't have to talk too much about the sustainability sites. Uh, aviation is moving heavily into the position to be kind of the last um, transport sector de to be uh, decarbonized. Uh, um, and at the same time, the European vision for aviation calls for drastic reduction in all kinds of emissions, CO2, particles, NOx, noise, while at the same time reducing the door-to-door -door time for most travelers before uh, below four hours. And um, from our perspective, uh, uh, then it makes a lot of sense to look into Evito design that can get into a market where you can get three, four, five hundred kilometers of range plus reserve. And uh, we we have basically uh, initially designed uh, um, a trade-off tool ourselves where we can look at all the technology pieces coming together and with today's technology pieces in fuel cells, uh, hydrogen storage and, and the clever cooling and integration, we see ranges of 500 kilometers with such a vehicle as we, we show here, uh, four passengers, one pilot and designed according to the limitations of the EASA SCV toy. Um, we have three core um, patterns that, that we are preparing, uh, mainly around the cooling of the uh, fuel cell. Uh, so several, several cooling technologies combined. Um, and that's, that's kind of uh, where, where we're looking at. Um, and then uh, the, the two other that, that are uh, a bit behind is an optimized um, a pressurized hydrogen tank integration and also the overall kind of the, the balance of planned integration into the aircraft, looking at the synergies where, where you can drive down mass and drive up the efficiency. Um, we, we have uh, by now uh, three great technology partners. Um, uh, very initially, we, we uh, approached Intelligent Energy. A uh, huge shout out also to uh, Jonathan uh, and, and his team. They will also present later. Uh, they are really uh, making worthwhile technology development in making fuel cells reliable and lightweight for aerospace use. And um, also their cooling technology is very interesting. Um, and, and we kind of are looking deeply into integrating this into a dedicated uh, system. We also looked at retrofit, but since it is very sensible in mass and also in cooling drag, um, you really have to design the vehicle around the integration of the fuel cell and vice versa. And then we also have Apus, uh, shout out to, to Philip and his team, and uh, they are supporting us and um, we are 
um, having having great partners with them. Um, BAM, the, the German Materials Research Institute, uh, we, we have a small research partnership with them and we are allowed to use their um, dedicated uh, uh, airspace. Uh, it's an EDR just south of Berlin where we can do most of our flight testing. And we, we have a few more uh, technology partnerships coming up, so um, but that's that's for, for early next year, let's say. Uh, looking at our engineering timeline, so we are working on this concept since roughly two and a half years, since uh, one year with a, a team of seven and, and kind of full force. Uh, we have two prototypes uh, flying by now, the first one uh, in late 2020, which was mainly to de-risk our flight controller with a two meter uh, model. And now our 25% scale model that is flying since mid of this year, um, still um, under battery power. Um, uh, and, and we are kind of preparing to, to fly under, under fuel cells soon. And we are designing a 50% scale, and that is intended to kind of onboard um, more scaling technologies. So, so um, aviation grade motors and inverters and and the, uh, the the liquid cooled fuel cell and and so on. So our twenty five percent scale that's kind of where where all our uh, engineering comes together and where we try to validate our our engineering assumptions around the flight control law developments. Also for transition flight, um, we think we can get away with a fully mechanically flight controller in cruise flight, uh, which will I think be quite quite an important differentiator to to reduce kind of the uh, software in the loop um, and and the, the amount of software uh, of the flight controller you have to validate and certify um, also looking at the contingencies and then um, we we mainly use the 25 percent for the first look at slow speed handling qualities and um, are preparing to go through full transition soon um, kind of slow transition we have looked at, but um, there, there's there's quite some room, uh, some way to go. And we are right now preparing the mechanical integration of the uh, subscale fuel cell system of intelligent energy, um, and um, kind of have the mechanical integration prepared. And are now looking into the test, the, test, um, test. Okay, can can you still hear me? I yeah, yeah. So. Okay, okay. Awesome. All right. And so, um, yeah, so early next year, uh, I think we, we have some interesting news coming up. But um, for now, that's, that's what we do. Um, so this is basically what we're talking about. We, we see that, that there's a very interesting market where once you can cross those uh, four or 500 kilometer range in a meaningful way at, at a meaningful speed at the same time, so 250, 260 kilometers per hour, we think is kind of the, the right mix. Then you really can can um, bring an interesting uh, mission to to the market. And here I will show you a quick video of our flight test campaign. Right. Yeah. So, so that's it in a in a nutshell. Um, as you can see, we like to bring hardware into a relevant uh, uh, environment and fly it early to to quickly learn and and iterate. And that's that's part of our DNA and what uh, uh, what we think makes uh, makes sense going forward. So that's that's uh, all I have for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, yeah, very interesting because uh, we had a lot of discussions on uh, fuel cell, uh, and it's getting more and more. For uh, let's, I can imagine, like when electric flying started, there were discussions talking about uh, fuel cell hydrogen, uh, saying, "Okay, it will come." Some people even said it's the technology of the future and will ever be, but. It seems to be that things are moving. And uh, so 
we have one of the technology partners actually now here, Philip Scheffel from the company APOS. They have worked in several uh, projects in electric uh, aviation and especially on the fuel cell side. Uh, they are located near Berlin in an airfield. So if you ever want to see some of these things flying, maybe visiting them could be a good option. And uh, yeah, I leave the word to you, Philip. Um, let's try if the screen share works. Yes, can you hear me? We hear you fine. And we see your screen. So I go my screen. The screen. You... Pardon? And now yes. you see my presentation, right? I see your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning and, <clears throat> and afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> and uh, thank you to my neighbor uh, from Berlin, uh, to Johannes for the good presentation before. Um, yeah, we move uh, a long way together, um, I would say, in the field of aviation and uh, um, especially now in electric aviation that uh, is now maybe since six or uh, seven years. And uh, it's nice to see how everything develops. And uh, really, you are totally right. Uh, it's, it's converging uh, a little bit nowadays. Um, I have the feeling to the fuel cell. And um, that proves that we are all on the on the correct path. Um, I want shortly, uh, I want to talk today about um, our current status of APUS and um, not so much about the technology itself because during in the last presentations, um, if also here at the eFlight forum, I did that uh, a lot. And um, I think it might be interesting to see um, how uh, APUS is proceeding. I will start with the video. To get you back on the topic, um, we are developing zero mission aircraft, the Apple I-2 and the Apple I-5, different versions of our location close to Berlin. Also. engineers working for several programs and uh, in the meanwhile we are um, part 21j uh, certified uh, 21g certified and iso 9100 the 21g is very fresh uh, from the last week uh, we got received the certificate and yeah now we are uh, uh, we are complete uh, we can uh, really move on also in our agenda for zero mission aircrafts and uh, what is new on, on APUS is that we completely restructurize the company. Uh, so when we in the past more worked as an engineering uh, company, we are converging more and more to, um, uh, to be fully dedicated to the uh, zero emission field. And um, of course, with the goal to be, to be an aircraft manufacturer uh, in the future. Our current development programs, uh, so what is what I would say is really active uh, in the prototype workshop are the uh, two aircraft, APUS I-2 and APUS I-5-100, uh, what is the 
uh, first version of a product family um, of the Apus i5. Um, and uh, yeah, the Apus i2 is um, a general, a typical general aviation uh, um, cruising aircraft that uh, is compar uh, comparable to four-seater aircraft nowadays. It should have, um, the, the, the goal was and is uh, to be not worse than um, fossil or combustion engine driven aircrafts, um, but be 100% zero emission. And in the future, that means, of course, cleaner, but also cheaper uh, flying. To just memorize how is the internal structure of the Apus I-2 and what are the USP um, of this aircraft, um, uh, the most important and remarkable uh, feature is, of course, the integrated hydrogen fuel tank. It's a pressurized uh, hydrogen inside the wings at the pressure of something around uh, 300 bar. And uh, that enables us to use the volume in the wings uh, to store the hydrogen and uh, to not be forced to use uh, a very worthful uh, fuselage uh, volume or to uh, have some external hydrogen fuel tanks that increases the drag. And we all know that um, the powertrains that we are developing here are uh, have a much lower power density and of course uh, the aircrafts have lower energy density than um, older aircrafts and uh, we need to gain all efficiency that we can get uh, from the aircraft and that means we don't want to have external tanks. So with this, um, with this structure we achieve at the same time and uh, yeah that's really the benefit from that system. Um, a stronger structure by the uh, pressurized tanks, so the tanks themselves are the spars in the wings and uh, carry the aerodynamic structure. And with this virtual reduction of uh, the wing weight, because the spar can be uh, let out, there's no um, other spar than the, uh, the than the fuel tanks, we can achieve um, energy densities of more than 3000 watt hours per kilogram and <clears throat> that is uh, really competitive compared to uh, automotive pressurized tanks that are somehow about uh, 1,800, 1,600 watt hours per kilogram. The mission profile is quite typical uh, for a cruising aircraft. Um, the range is uh, competitive of 500 nautical miles. Uh, we will fly maximum uh, in the first version and the first generation of the aircraft maximum uh, 10,000 feet. Um, and all the other um, parameters like cruise, like the climb rate, uh, like the cruising speeds are more or less uh, comparable to, let's say, uh, a Piper Archer or uh, aircraft uh, from that generation. Um, I don't say Cirrus SR22 in this uh, moment because the cruising speeds will be uh, slightly lower. Um, that's a contribution um, to the lower, to the higher energy efficiency uh, during cruise flight to reach uh, to achieve the range. I think uh, this is something we are fa we all in uh, who are working in the field of electric aviation are facing that challenge. Um, to increase aerodynamic uh, efficiency. A big part of aerodynamic uh, efficiency is the cooling system. It increases significant drag, especially with uh, fuel cell uh, systems as we uh, operate at lower um, uh, operating temperatures. And um, there was a significant amount of uh, engineering hours spent in um, designing and developing probable uh, thermal management systems and that results in the current system where we still hope of course to decrease um, cooler sizes uh, to increase at the end uh, cruise speeds. Some insights in the workshop. Uh, we are very actively uh, building now those aircrafts um, and what I really like in our setup is that the engineers themselves are finally in the workshop. We have a, a very small team in the workshop. Um, they are never able to build all the 
all those parts and uh, yeah our engineering department is directly connected to the workshop so the engineers are in the workshop um, and building those structures um, here you can see the internal structure of the Apus i2 fuselage in the background uh, one ready built fuselage and uh, yeah here on on this slide <clears throat> you can see our um, a test bed uh, for the hydrogen fuel cell powertrain. It's uh, what you can see here is one uh, one lane of the twin engine aircraft, the uh, one side propeller, MRX engine, uh, converters, cooling systems, uh, and the fuel cell delivered by power cell in this case, um, and our um, our test bed. Um, just. Uh, some uh, some more insights on the uh, on the system of the aircraft here you can see the packaging of the fuel cell system in the Apus i2 nose part so here you can see the ms100 power cell uh, fuel stack on the left hand side it looks in the same way on the right hand side so we have two independent uh, powertrains and um, all this system is uh, repackaged by us and um, this is also in prototyping right now so it's just i just took this picture yesterday uh, from the workshop um, it is uh, partly disassembled now because um, painting has to be done and um, then we move on with the testing on the fuel cell system itself some insights in the apus i2 structure um, you can see here um, the wing tank structure from uh, mounted uh, and glued to the to the wing or bonded to the wing um, the four seats and uh, this is just the prototype test configuration for the first flights we will have an additional fuel tank in the fuselage uh, for redundancy reasons um, and um, yeah on those pictures you can see the general arch architecture of um, the wing fuselage attachment and uh, the nacelle design, so the batteries in the, uh, in the engine nacelles. With this setup, uh, we visited several exhibitions this year. Maybe some of you uh, saw this in reality, so uh, you can sit in and, uh, and um, check if you like it. And uh, yeah, the interesting part of this picture is the, the fuel, one of the fuel tank tubes that you can see here. So uh, they are produced already. Um, such a tube weighs around 80 kilogram and uh, can contain, yeah, somehow um, between seven, six, seven, eight uh, kilogram of uh, hydrogen. The second program I mentioned before is the Apus I5. Uh, and um, here I want to talk mainly about the Apus I5 100 because this is also under uh, in prototyping right now it's a 4.8 ton maximum takeoff weight aircraft mainly designed as a test bed uh, for Rolls Royce hybrid electric powertrain systems it will fly in, in the first version with two diesel engines on the inner nacelles um, to have a, um, a reliable uh, test setup at the beginning and on the outer nacelles there will be different electrical powertrains mounted up to 300 kilowatts and in the fuselage there will be the power generator could be a fuel cell or um, turbocharger unit or other uh, power generation systems um, this aircraft in the prototyping is a little bit further than the apus i2 the uh, fuselage is already um, assembled tail booms are produced um, here you can see how the tail booms are in production, but this already somehow one half year ago. And um, yeah, you can see the steel frame of the center fuselage. So the cockpit uh, section is already built. Control system is um, um, integrated. The wings are in production. All those parts we are producing in-house. Um, here you can see an eight meter long outer wing, the right outer wing of the Apus I2 wing, uh, you saw it's 26 meter span, and all those molds we mill in-house. 
some ready produced parts. The uh, tail booms that you saw before under construction are ready now. The, uh, the horizontal tail is ready and um, we are pro proceeding quite fast. Some words also to our facility development. Um, currently, I'm sitting here in this office and this is um, our current workshop. Um, we finished um, a second building uh, this year and uh, yeah, I have, uh, on the next slide, you will see a photo for that, uh, mainly for testing and assembly. It's one and a half, uh, it's 1,500 uh, square meters big. This was 1,000. And we plan also in Straussberg Airfield to build up the production facilities. Um, this has a little bit time until we do this. So let's say from 26 on, we will do that. That was um, in autumn this year. We started to build and now is already done. And uh, yeah, as I said at the beginning last week, we achieved even our production. Um, we received our production approval certificate. So um, the all the barriers are removed, the main barriers, not all barriers. Um, to develop ourselves um, to an aircraft manufacturer uh, for the future. The planning is still uh, to fly uh, 2023 with the Apus I-5-100 and um, end of 23, but might be uh, early 2024 with the Apus I-2 uh, with hydrogen powertrain, with the fuel cell powertrain, and hopefully very soon it will look like this on the sky over Berlin. Thank you for attention. I cannot hear anybody. No, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, no. It was my, my mistake. My, my mic was muted. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, please stay online because I already have some questions. We already have some questions from the podium. And just a reminder to the podium again um, that we uh, could have, uh, you can have questions like online, you can send it into us. If you're in the Zoom session, you can send it into us via chat. Uh, or if you're in the Chinese venue, you at any time can go and uh, take one of the mics, give out the information, and then we will ask the question for you. If you want to get in contact with any of our speakers, uh, just contact us and we will uh, forward uh, it to the speakers so that they can change your, their details with you. Um, and just last, before I announce my next speaker, um, the uh, question is, uh, how could you see now you have to leave you have some other urgent uh, things to do hello? so you don't have the can possibility hear us? hello sir yes hello hey. yeah uh, hello. my name is ethan from the uh, from the china side can i ask a question to the uh, mr no, no, Felix? sorry 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 the the q and a session is at the end of the session i just want to get the questions now ready and then we will have the question immediately sorry for this uh, miss oh gotcha Anderson. gotcha okay 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 no okay so thank you my, uh, my, let's go to our next speaker and uh, maybe uh, you can unshare your screen philip uh, because it's still shared yes and i would like to introduce uh, Another partner of our first project, uh, Nex, uh, which is Intelligent Energy. We have it already on your screen, Jonathan Douglas Smith. He's going to give us uh, uh, some details on the fuel cell side, which is a core of a hydrogen aircraft. So, um, Jonathan, I leave you the stage. You're already on. I think your mic is unmuted. So I mute mine and uh, perhaps if you say a word just to check if the audio is fine. Can you hear me okay? We hear you fine. Thank you very much. And I, I, I unmute myself, stage is yours. Excellent. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity for allowing me to present. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, good morning to my uh, uh, European uh, colleagues. Uh, some excellent presentations from APUS and um, NEX. Um, 
great job, uh, Johannes um, and Philip. Um, today, I'm going to give a quick overview of intelligent energy, uh, which are uh, developing groundbreaking um, hydrogen fuel cell systems for uh, future generation aircraft. Um, so at, at Intelligent Energy, um, I look after the, the aerospace strategy, um, which, uh, and today I'm going to specifically cover eVTOLs and sub-regional aircraft. So uh, just a bit about Intelligent Energy. Uh, so we're based um, an hour and a half north of London uh, in the UK. Um, our R&D facility is here, um, but we do have operations in the US, uh, Japan, um, South Korea, and China. Um, South Korea has been actually quite a large market for hydrogen fuel cells for us um, over the past uh, year, and we've seen enormous amount of growth in that region, um, as well as Japan and the US, uh, with a, a, a large amount of opportunity in China as well. Um, so Intelligent Energy has actually been around since 2001, um, and in the past sort of uh, 15 years, um, of its existence. Um, it, it has been focused on research and development of products, uh, but in the past uh, six to eight years, it has been turning that research and development into a certified product and rolling them out into the market. And we now have <clears throat> thousands of these products out in the market, um, which are being used every day by customers. But the, uh, the core valuation of Intelligent Intelligent energy is its rich intel, uh, intellectual property, uh, which you can see um, there. We have over a thousand patents uh, relating to our air cooled and evaporately cooled uh, fuel cell products, which power a variety of applications. So, what those applications are um, are split up into different categories. Obviously, today's focus on IE flight, um, but um, uh, for your just for briefly for your information, uh, we, we do have uh, products um, in IE SOAR, which is fuel cells for drones. Um, uh, companies like Shell are using uh, fuel cell powered drones with our fuel cell for oil and gas pipeline inspection on a weekly basis. Um, IE Lift, uh, which is fuel cells for materials handling equipment, so fuel cell forklift powered trucks and uh, stationary power applications. Um, BMW are using um, IE lift powered um, automated guided vehicles to power their um, the, these vehicles around their factories um, around Europe um, um, and moving their equipment around in their warehouses. IE drive, which is our high powered evaporately cooled um, products for the automotive and stationary power markets. Um, we're actually working with um, Shang'an, uh, third largest uh, Chinese automotive manufacturer uh, for their fuel cell powered SUV program in which we're delivering um, our evaporate killed IE drive uh, product to them. Um, and uh, on the stationary power side, uh, we've recently uh, signed a supply agreement uh, to supply 100 of these units for stationary power application in South Korea. And finally, the, the exciting IE flight uh, products, which is combining the um, lightweight uh, material that goes into the IE SOAR product and the evaporately cooled technology, which is in the IE drive product, uh, combining those two technologies together to make um, very lightweight and power dense uh, fuel cell stacks that will power future generation aircraft. So here's a list of some of our partners. Um, over the years, we've worked on a, a variety of projects. Uh, we're no stranger to uh, large scale projects. Uh, uh, currently, with, we're in a, a large project with GKN Aerospace under H2 Gear. Um, we've worked with um, Boeing, Airbus, Zero Avia, uh, Nex uh, presented earlier. It's one of our partners for the eVTOL program. Um, and uh, we, we have a rich amount of project experience, which have uh, resulted in successful products being put on the market. In terms of uh, where we are versus uh, our competitors, uh, here is a slide which uh, really captures how, how uh, we stand up against the competition. Um, and in our IE SOAR fu uh, fuel cells for UEVs, uh, we are the most specific power dense 
uh, fuel cell available on the market. Uh, this is publicly available information. Uh, and we, as a company, we, from early days, have invested a lot, lot of resource in lightweighting our fuel cell technology compared to our competitors as we really saw a market in, uh, for it. Um, um, more so than other areas. Uh, so we put a lot of focus on, on our lightweight fuel cells, uh, specifically for aerospace applications. Uh, so, so as mentioned, we, we do have a, a rich amount of experience in high powered fuel cells um, uh, and aerospace projects. Uh, we actually were involved in the first ever um, manned uh, fuel cell flight of an aircraft. And this was actually all the way back in 2008 um, with a 25 kilowatt evaporately cooled fuel cell system. We did the same again in a few in a project a few years later, the Infica project. Um, and in 2013, um, that was using a 35 kilowatt evaporately cooled fuel cell. There was then there was not much activity in um, the um, aerospace world for decarbonization and this, this drive uh, to go zero emissions. Uh, but in 2018, um, Airbus did design an APU, uh, which won a German Aviation uh, Innovation Award. But then in, in, in 2019, uh, the aviation world uh, almost uh, took a U-turn uh, and there was a huge drive to decarbonize and, and Zero Avia um, sort of led this project in, in, in the UK uh, and this drive to decarbonize uh, aviation was started off with Project High Flyer and Intelligent Energy was involved uh, by looking what the art of the possible was um, from a product point of view of what we could do of um, making lightweight products uh, for this market. And the outcome of that project was really successful. We um, then were selected to be a part of Project H2 Gear. Uh, which is a, a very exciting uh, five-year program uh, that's a UK-based program to develop a groundbreaking hydrogen propulsion system uh, that will power a zero-emission aircraft that will enter into service as soon as 2026. So it's a £54 million uh, initial um, investment to the program uh, with £200 million in additional funding expected to follow. Um, and uh, um, GKN Aerospace are the lead uh, partner on this pro program, um, supported by Intelligent Energy, developing the lightweight stacks that go into these products. In terms of uh, our IE Drive automotive fuel cells, which are in the market today, um, on the left is our IE Drive heavy duty uh, fuel cell, uh, which I mentioned we're supplying um, 100 of these uh, over the next year to South Korea, in the supply agreement with um, our partners whole green um, but this can also be used for bus and truck applications um, it's rated for uh, the, the duty cycle for those those uh, applications and then on the right um, you have the i drive p100 which is repackaged uh, for uh, to fit on in an engine engine bay of an suv um, and you can see here in the front is a the radiator of the the fuel cell and there's a gap just behind the radiator and that's actually to fit the uh, the drivetrain of um, uh, the SUV, um, so it can be packaged neatly inside in the bonnet. Um, recently, we we hit a really nice milestone in terms of power output and power density, uh, and achieved 160 kilowatts out of our IE Drive HD. Um, after parasitics uh, and rating the fuel cell system through life that'll be around 100 kilowatts um, uh, over a long lifespan uh, but it was nice uh, to achieve this um, power output at a beginning of life uh, fuel cell stack so this is the really interesting slide and highlights the unique selling point of our technology um, fuel cell systems are hard they can get complex um, Evaporately cool technology has the goal of removing that complexity uh, and increasing the, the power density as a result, um, as well as reliability with lower component count um, and a lower cost at uh, volume production. 
Um, so we have a special technique, which is injecting deionized water directly onto the fuel cell stack, uh, taking advantage of the, uh, the um, enth enthalpy of vaporization uh, by the, the water evaporating. Um, uh, means that you can take a huge amount of more heat out of the, the stack um, and uh, more efficiently cool it. Um, so this means uh, that we, because of this deionized water, it, it automatically rehumidifies the stack itself. Uh, so we don't need any cooling plates, um, so we can get a smaller stack, um, and we don't need a humidifier. Uh, we've only got one uh, cooling and uh, self-humidifying loop. Um, so overall, it's a much simpler system, um, and it's a much more power dense uh, system. So um, for electric aviation, um, the, the challenge against uh, battery energy density and the weight is always a challenge. Um, and this slide really highlights um, um, that in, in, in effect. Uh, so so this, this is a, a, a Carnegie Mellon paper, which shows the uh, eVTOL manufacturers battery requirements that are needed in order to, uh, to meet the um, stated aircraft endurance from the VTOL manufacturers. Um, so it basically shows that uh, a lot of the um, eVTOLs out there um, don't have uh, battery technology that exists today in order to meet the range that they uh, hope to achieve in their aircraft. What we've done is overlaid on how a few, our IE flight powered fuel cell systems compares versus um, uh, this uh, projection. Uh, and it shows the, the highlight of the, the benefit of the energy density and specific power uh, that uh, the fuel cell system can offer in comparison. Um, so on a conceptual uh, study of what the R of a possible is on a basis of four seater eVTOL, uh, this uh, really highlights the comparison again. Uh, so on a, a pure battery solution, uh, you can expect 200 kilometers range. Um, on the fuel cell system solution, you can expect um, over 600 kilometers worth of range um, and also decreasing the weight of, of the, the fuel cell system, which means uh, by over 250 kilograms, which means more passengers or more payloads to carry on each mis mission. Additionally, the, another the main benefit is refueling time. Um, there's a lot of fast chargers in the eVTOL battery world that um, uh, it can give um, uh, fast charging rates uh, for the eVTOL, but uh, the faster you charge, the faster you degrade your battery. Um, and th there are a lot of trade-offs there, uh, but that, that trade-off doesn't exist uh, when refilling hydrogen in um, your, your tank. Um, so the, the 10 to 20 minute um, uh, refueling times of this hydrogen cylinder is hard to compete against uh, com when you're looking at batteries. So what does a, an integration actually look like? Um, so this is uh, a conceptual um, eVTOL, um, one that we've uh, played around with in-house uh, and uh, looked at some analysis on. Uh, and this, this includes a, a 500 liter um, gaseous hydrogen cylinder and uh, 175 kilowatts IE flight powered fuel cell system, uh, which also has hybrid batteries for takeoff and landing. Um, so this is what uh, this is what a typical this is a two seater eVTOL, um, and, and what an integration uh, would look like. And we, we work with uh, all of our customers um, and support with integration um, to make that transition and integration process as simple as as for, as possible from their point of view. So in terms of uh, time scales, um, we will be releasing our first generation IE flight uh, product uh, to customers um, early to mid 2024. Uh, and then our second generation uh, higher powered um, uh, fuel cell uh, will be releasing to partners in uh, about the middle of 2025. And the, the second generation um, fuel cell uh, will be targeting um, a full certification and serial production um, to be put into uh, eVTOLs of, of the future. Uh, the first generation um, will be used for initial ground-based testings by customers 
um, and uh, dem flight demonstrators. Um, the, the second generation product will be the, uh, the certified product that will be used um, in service in the years to come. And final slide, um, Intelligent Energy is in the process of finalizing our the plans for our gigawatt scale factory uh, to produce uh, thousands and tens of thousands in 2030 fuel cells every year. Um, we've, um, we're actually right next door to Rolls-Royce and we've assembled a, a world-class engineering team um, that from Rolls-Royce uh, predominantly um, that have developed um, Rolls-Royce engines over decades. Um, and our goal is to, uh, to now do this, but with a zero emission uh, fuel cell system uh, that can power these future aircraft. And uh, this uh, global manufacturing center based here in, in the UK will help us do that with, the, with this team we, we've assembled. So currently we're, we're to around 220 employees, uh, but we anticipate scaling to around 800 employees uh, by the end of um, the first half of 2025. So that, that, that concludes my presentation. Um, thanks a lot for, for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, very interesting because like we had, uh, uh, your, uh, several questions were actually coming in during the presentations before and you already answered some uh, with your presentation, like for example, the weight uh, power ratio, uh, which is one of the key questions here. I see already another and we see how small the world is and it is working together because our next presenter will be uh, Michael Friend from Zero Avia. But before uh, I announce Mike, I, I just want to say, I forgot to say this before, maybe if you looked at our schedule, you were missing Bosch. Unluckily, they couldn't make it uh, this time. They promised to be in the forum again next time. Um, uh, Michael, uh, like a lot of other speakers, old time friend from a long time, because we talk about electric avi aviation already for a, a while. And he used to be the vice president, new technologies. I think that was your last position at Boeing uh, and has done some of the very first aircraft, which were also mentioned uh, in some of the pres presentations before in this position. Uh, he's now advisor for Zero Avia. And with this, I think uh, I, we see if you can share your screen. And thanks again, because he was already up yesterday. He lives uh, in Seattle, so he has to get up very early to be in our uh, forum. So, and we have, we see this, we have watchers all around the globe. So um, tell your friends, if they are interested in, ele in electric aviation, they should join our sessions next time and the other sessions we have around the world with this. Maybe let's do a mic check, Mike. <laughs> Uh, yes, can you hear me? We hear you fine, and I'm off the stage. It's not in presentation mode yet. You're still okay. in the uh, editing mode. No. That's perfect, and I'm off. Okay, very good. Well, uh, good morning, and... Uh, Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk about uh, Zero Avia and uh, their attempts to make hydrogen electric uh, aviation a, a reality. So uh, Zero Avia has been working at this for several years now. Uh, I've become involved as a, uh, an advisor. Uh, I have a long history with fuel cell aircraft. I was the project leader for the, uh, the Boeing fuel cell aircraft that was mentioned during the intelligent energy uh, presentation. And uh, I've uh, been interested uh, for a long time in the, the possibilities for hydrogen and fuel cells. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure in the last couple of years. I, I think uh, when you take a look at the projections for uh, uh, the, the miles flown by passengers, uh, if you look at the, uh, the Boeing or Airbus uh, uh, projections for the amount of flying in the next 30 years, 
you can see it's constantly increasing at the same time that uh, uh, ICAO and other world aviation authorities have pledged to cut their CO2 emissions. So there's, uh, you know, we're not going to get a pass on this in the next few years. So uh, we can't just manage uh, efficiency gains, but we really have to uh, offer some breakthrough tre technologies that are really going to uh, reduce the amount of CO2 being put in the atmosphere. So, uh, you know, you take a look at this uh, projected 3% traffic growth between now and 2050, and the path that we need to take to get to net zero emissions. And the difference between these two is, uh, is the challenge that we have to address. And, and uh, Zero Avia believes that, that hydrogen is gonna be one of the key uh, elements that helps us uh, bridge the gap between that projected traffic growth and the, the path to, uh, to net zero. So we have to take a look at the, uh, the climate impact of air travel and it's, it's CO2, but it's more than that. It's things like uh, water vapor, uh, nitrous oxides, soot particles. So uh, what Zero Avia has done is looked at, at a variety of different technologies that might address all of these uh, uh, climate impact elements and concluded that, um, that hydrogen fuel cells are, are a, a quite a, a good technology. You know, if, if we uh, take a look at the, the different technologies, uh, you know, we can see that each one of them has pluses and minuses, but on, on balance, if you look at all of them, uh, it occurs to zero obvia that, uh, that hydrogen and uh, hydrogen fuel cells have the, the biggest net impact and, and the fewest drawbacks of all of the, uh, the major technologies that are being uh, considered as we go forward with aviation technology. So Zero Avia is focused on, on uh, hydrogen electric propulsion using low carbon hydrogen as the, as the fuel source. So the, the vision uh, has to do with uh, the complete infrastructure, starting with uh, the, the creation of the hydrogen. And uh, Zero Avia has been working with uh, people like Shell to develop the hydrogen production side of this. So uh, you know, in the uh, picture, you can see uh, solar providing the, uh, the electrical energy to create the, the gaseous hydrogen, which would then be uh, uh, fueling the hydrogen fuel cell powered uh, aircraft. So you can see uh, the, the kind of target aircraft shown here for the propulsion system that uh, Zero Avia calls the ZA2000 which is approximately a, a two megawatt class uh, propulsion system that would be used for regional aircraft. So this is the uh, eventual target uh, over the next 10 years for Zero Avia. So if you break down the powertrain system, there's, there's really five core elements, you know, the hydrogen management system, the hydrogen power generation system, the power distribution system, electrical propulsion system, and then the full authority digital engine control. So Zero Avia has been aggressively hiring people to work on every one of these elements. And uh, it's Zero Avia's intention to have uh, an integrated powertrain offering that uh, airframe manufacturers could then integrate into a, a variety of different aircraft. So if we look at the, the time scale in the April of 2019, Zero Avia uh, flew its first prototype, which was uh, a modified uh, Piper Malibu in California. So their an initial base of operations was in Hollister, California near San Francisco. And they've since opened up a very large base in the United Kingdom. And uh, the activity in the, the United Kingdom uh, right now centers around 
the aircraft that you see at the right side, which is a Dornier 228 test aircraft. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the Dornier is ready to fly. You'll probably be seeing a news item in, in the next weeks to come uh, talking about the first flight of this. Uh, all of the, the ground testing has been completed and we're just waiting for the uh, official approval to, to fly in the United Kingdom. So leading up to that, there's been a lot of subcomponent testing. Uh, in 2021, uh, in Hollister, California, there was a, a ground test using what's called the uh, Hypertruck test rig. So this Hypertruck allows Zero Avia to do ground testing of the completely integrated uh, powertrain, in, including uh, hydrogen, fuel cell, battery, uh, motor, motor controller, and uh, heat exchangers, all in one integrated package. So uh, we can uh, play a little uh, video here. Uh, let me know. You can hear it. We're good. There is, but there is no sound. If you want to have sound, maybe. Okay. Uh, so it looks like we're having a, a problem with the uh, the sound. Okay. Um, so what I can. You you could reshare the screen and then click the button at the left side, which says share, share the sound. But for this, you have to stop sharing and reshare. Okay. Uh, well, tell you what, um, I, I don't want to take time uh, yeah. to try and, and recycle here. So what I'll describe is, is that this video is, is showing uh, the ground testing of the, uh, the Dornier 2228 uh, it's available on YouTube, and uh, they've accomplished uh, high-speed taxi testing up to this point and have completed all of the uh, uh, pre-flight testing necessary for the UK uh, uh, certification authorities. So we expect the, the results of that uh, any day now in terms of the, the first flight. So what we've uh, accomplished uh, already with Zero Avia is uh, flight testing of the six seat, uh, 250 kilowatt uh, prototype. The Dornier 228 is gonna allow us to scale up to a, a 600 kilowatt system. So in the, the Dornier test bed, there's uh, uh, the integration of the fuel cells and the hydrogen tanks and the, uh, uh, the test equipment all inside the, uh, the fuselage of the aircraft. Uh, a later version of this Dornier 228 would fly with the uh, gaseous hydrogen tanks mounted under the wing. Uh, the first commercial offering of this is seen being available in a couple of years. Uh, what's in development is a much larger system using the uh, ZA2000 class power plant, uh, which would be for aircraft like uh, the de Havilland Dash 8 or the ATR 72. And uh, this would be a scaled up version of what's, what's being tested in the, uh, the Dornier 228. And it's hoped that uh, this system would be ready in around the 2027 timeframe. So you can see a lot of the key technologies that are being developed at, uh, at Zero Avia. Uh, they have their own uh, proprietary inverter technology and hypercore motor technology that they're working on. Now, some of the test aircraft will use uh, off-the-shelf available technology, uh, but Zero Avia's uh, goal is to have uh, their own uh, proprietary technology for each one of these uh, elements that's required for the, the drivetrain. So in working towards that technology, Zero Avia uh, has actually acquired a, a world-class uh, fuel cell stack manufacturer uh, called High Point. 
uh, what they're especially working on is a higher temperature proton exchange membrane fuel cells that would allow uh, much higher uh, uh, energy density and uh, the acquisition of, of High Point will allow them to focus their development strictly towards that uh, uh, ZA2000 uh, megawatt class power plant that's intended for uh, the 2027 timeframe. So uh, the infrastructure is just as important uh, as the uh, integration of the power plant into the airplane. So, we're working with a, a lot of partners to think about the, the production of the hydrogen, the logistics and refueling, and how that would uh, work at the airport. So uh, we're actually having some demonstrations at the Hollister California Airport to integrate every uh, uh, part of this chain from the, the solar power to produce the, the hydrogen to the, the handling and refueling of the aircraft uh, on the ramp. So there's been a demonstration at the Kemble Airport in the UK uh, showing uh, uh, solar power, on-site electrolysis, storage, and mobile airplane refueling. Uh, so we're not just thinking about the airplane side of this, but also the airport and infrastructure side for a complete solution for potential customers. So we talk about uh, uh, sector coupling, which is the interconnectivity of energy consuming sectors with the power producing sectors. You know, a lot of people have uh, thought about how hydrogen and fit very nicely with uh, uh, renewable energy sources that uh, uh, have intermittent production like uh, wind and solar, where the production of hydrogen uh, could actually uh, kind of level out the, uh, uh, the production for these renewable sources and, and um, produce kind of a win-win situation. So Zero Avia, uh, was formed uh, several years ago. They have a lot of partnerships with uh, big companies, uh, Alaska Airlines, uh, United Airlines. Um, Alaska Airlines have uh, recently announced as uh, partners for this with the intention of investigating how the Zero Avia drivetrain can be integrated into their fleet uh, over the next couple of years. So there have also been a lot of uh, investors, uh, you know, Bill Gates uh, has been one of the investors in this. Uh, there's been about $150 million raised that uh, is funding the uh, rapid growth that, that Zero Avia has been going through for the uh, last couple of years. So the uh, uh, airframers that Zero Avia is currently working with are people like uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, RJ, uh, De Havilland, uh, HAL, uh, working primarily on regional uh, transport aircraft at this point. Uh, we have strategic technology partners uh, like uh, Shell, like uh, Skipple Group on the airport side, and others that um, are looking at kind of the, the complete solution all the way from hydrogen to aircraft production. And uh, they've built up an executive team pulling in people from many different industries. And uh, uh, right now, there's a total team of about 206 people in the US and the UK. And uh, that's changing almost every day as they bring on people to, uh, to scale up for the, the next round of technology. So that's the, uh, the final slide that I have. And I uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this. Thank you, Mike. And uh, again, very interesting to see the progress because uh, I have to admit when I talk with people and I, uh, I tell them, yes, there will be now fuel cell aircraft uh, <coughs> soon. Uh, there is a lot of people say, no, I don't think so. So yeah, if everybody could come back up again for the uh, Q&A sessions, Jonathan, yes, and uh, Philip. Okay, perfect. So we have already ramped up several questions. 
Um, and uh, so the first of uh, one would be from my side uh, uh, to Mike, uh, who was speaking last. You have been working very long time for Boeing. So uh, do you think that uh, like very, because very often if such new technology is happening, the people, the big companies just watch it. And then at some point uh, when they see, ah, really it's coming to the market, they go into this market making a fuel cell uh, aircraft themselves, for example. Do you think uh, that this, the large, the two large big ones, Airbus and Boeing, mm -hmm. they'll have a capability also to compete with Zero Avia, or do you think Zero Avia will be fast, faster? All right. Well, you know, uh, when I worked at Boeing, uh, we had a long history of looking at alternate fuel concepts. So as, as early as uh, uh, 1995, my team in new airplane product development at Boeing was looking at uh, um, a hydrogen fueled uh, 767 concept. Um, so, you know, in the early 2000s, my team was looking very actively at the use of hydrogen fuel cells to replace the gas turbine auxiliary power unit on a commercial airplane. And uh, I did a lot of work on that. So there's been a, a continuing interest for a long time. The, uh, uh, one of the reasons why Boeing has been a little bit hesitant to be a leader in the hydrogen fuel area had to do with the, uh, the infrastructure for the production of, of hydrogen. And that's always a very big discussion is even if you conclude that it's possible to integrate the hydrogen fuel cells into the airplane and to come up with a viable product, you have to be convinced that uh, on a global scale, you can produce the hydrogen in a green way that, uh, that actually makes sense and can be provided uh, on the ramp at the airport. So, uh, you know, the recent public announcements from Boeing and Airbus have shown that uh, they are becoming convinced that that is going to be a, a part of the, the future and they are trying to understand what's the best way to uh, introduce it into the world fleets. Okay, thank you. Um, I think especially one thing you mentioned, the, 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 the full supply chain around the world with hydrogen. I think these are things which are now changing faster than ever, because especially with this Russian attack war to Ukraine, where we now mm -hmm. the fossil energies become a shortage. There's especially in Germany, I can tell you, but in whole Europe, we have so much discussion on this going to hydrogen that I never experienced. So maybe this can have at least one positive aspect that it's getting us hydrogen into the, uh, into the air faster. My mm -hmm. next question uh, would be uh, to Philip, um, when do you think the I-2 will fly? And when is your plan that it can be certified? We should have asked this perhaps also to David Solar in the beginning, because at the end, you still have to go to EASA. But uh, what is your expectation there? And you have to ask this question every three months again, I think, <laughs> from, yes. uh, uh, from uh, current, uh, from today on, uh, we think early 24, the I2 can fly. And uh, as we are preparing the certification uh, all the time and in parallel since since the beginning, um, we expect a certification in uh, uh, 25, 26. Uh, it also depends, of course, on the component uh, suppliers. Um, we are not the, the only one, uh, the, on, the only critical path in that game. We are certifying the complete system, but also we need, for example, to be fast, we need a certified electrical motor, and this is not uh, not available available yet. And um, it depends a bit on that, but I have good hopes, and um, I'm, I'm I'm confident that um, those suppliers will work on those targets as well in the same timeline. Um, 
there there is a question which was in there it was partly already answered uh, by uh, the pr presentation of Jonathan uh, but uh, 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 there is, maybe we can specific answer it again, and this could be like your, uh, Johannes, uh, Jonathan, and Philip. Uh, the question is, uh, how does it look the, uh, concrete in the uh, with the integrated fuel cell drive, the weight uh, to power to weight ratio? Because one thing is, if I just look at the fuel cell, but if if I look at the whole system including the cooling system, what we heard is some point which is uh, difficult. Um, where do you see the, or actually it's a big question to everybody on the panel. Uh, so what, uh, where do you think, see it is now and can this also evolve? Because battery researchers tell us all the time, yeah, we will better, we get better, better every day. But um, uh, where, can it go? So where do you think the weight to power ratio is now and where it can be, for example, in five years? Is there still same changes to be made? And I think we have to differ there between uh, if, if we also take the, the tank between gas and liquid uh, hydrogen. So maybe, Philip, you're on the screen already. If you start first and then uh, we go through uh, the opinion of everybody to the subject. Mm. Yeah, of course, this is always a difficult question because it uh, you have to uh, really describe which components you include in this uh, in this discussion. And um, when you talk about power density, normally you you cannot include the tank itself because um, this is mm -hmm. extremely dependent on the endurance you want to achieve. And um, I would yeah. connect the fuel tank to the energy density and the um, uh, the fuel cell stack to the to the power density and um, yeah what we see is on the stack that there are um, power densities around one kilowatt per kilogram are the state of the art at the moment this is still much too less um, to get competitive uh, aircraft it should be better and uh, on the cooling system, there's a high potential to reduce weight. Um, and and um, I think Intelligent Energy has a very good approach uh, on that. That um, is a huge differentiator to other <coughs> um, uh, stack providers. And uh, yeah, we hope we can be better than something about uh, 0 0.8 kilowatt per kilogram on the whole system. Yeah. Okay. So maybe next, Mike, what do you think on this? Yeah, I, I think there's there's huge potential for improvement. Uh, you know, if you take a look at, at things like, uh, you know, what we call the balance of plant, uh, you know, the, the elements of the, the powertrain outside of the fuel cell stack. If you look at the intelligent energy uh, uh, power plant that we had involved in our uh, 2008 Boeing fuel cell demonstrator, there's been huge improvement made uh, since that time in the, the packaging and uh, development of the balance of plant elements. So I, I think you see that in, in uh, many industries where uh, it's, it's not just the core technology, the, the fuel cell stacks, but it, it's the, the blowers and the heat exchangers and the, the piping and plumbing that are uh, just improving all the time and so the, the advantage that uh, hydrogen fuel cells have over batteries is, is only going to increase with time. And then you have the, the, the second element of improving the fuel stack technology by going with things like higher temperature uh, proton exchange membranes. So I, I do see a lot of potential for improvement. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, perhaps you're muted uh, at the moment still. Can you unmute, Jonathan? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Just just to, to add on it from what the others have said. Um, at uh, we we've looked at uh, various uh, systems in customers' aircrafts and different powertrains. Um, from a, a stack power density, that's what we focus on uh, developing um, and optimizing around uh, for a specific power density because of our evaporately cooled technology. We don't have any cooling plates. Um, so um, at, at the moment, uh, uh, we, 
with the fact that we don't have any cooling plates we're we're, we're um in the next year will be around three kilowatts per kilogram at the stack level um and looking further uh, uh, uh past that uh we'll be looking at the six to, to seven kilowatts per kilogram at the stack level uh when that's moved into a system level um excluding the hydrogen storage element um it'd be looking at uh 1.5 to 2.2 kilowatts per kilogram at the, the system level um, integrated into the vehicle. Um, um, but uh, we are looking at uh, trade-offs with that um, because um, uh, the for hydrogen aviation uh, for operators, the, the cost is really important. And when we're trying to trade off looking at exotic materials to further reduce the weight increase in power density um, that may be great but um, ultimately we want the, the the solution to be viable from a cost point of view um, and um, we're we're looking at uh, that that, that trade-off with the, the market uh, to make it affordable as possible okay uh, johannes last but not least yes yeah, so um from from what 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 do we see basically um as as it was mentioned before on the component side there's still huge technological um potential so so there's like reaching saturation will, will take some time um and there are several um technologies that are kind of now also converging towards um more efficient cooling and cooling integration and uh, I, I think the, the the fuel cell itself is not a silver bullet, but if you design it carefully and mindfully with the vehicle inside, like like mentioned before, then you really can make an interesting difference in how uh, how you can operate or, or what what kind of mission you can uh, achieve. Okay. I have a, a kind of follow up question on the answer which uh, Philip said, but I don't know who. Maybe uh, also you could answer this because it's uh, if you he said that normally if you compare you don't can count the tank, but if you compare for example a now existing aircraft with its tank and the fuel and the and the propulsion uh, the motor which is a propulsion system with a battery. There you would count the battery, you would count the kind of inverters and the motor. And then when you count the fuel cell, uh, I think you also have to count the, the weight of the tank because it will be more higher, I suppose, than the tank of, uh, of an existing aircraft because you, you have this high pressurized or high cooled environment, which definitely takes more weight. So if you want to compare the two systems, what do you, uh, what do you say about this? Yeah, yeah um, I, I guess, I mean, um, you have to look at both uh, both ends independently. So power density and energy density. So it's a little bit difficult to, to compare apples to apples um, at, at, uh, at one design point. And so basically what, what Philip was pointing out is that if you look at the power density, you, you don't look too much uh, on the on the system mass on the on the tank. But if you look at the energy density so so range then of course the the tank plays a very important role and there the the structural integrated tank um, is a very interesting approach but but philip maybe you want to add a few more words yeah yeah it's exactly uh, correct and uh, of course really when you want to compare uh, the battery against uh, the fuel cell then you have to always consider all together and mm -hmm. uh, you have to compare it uh concerning one endurance for example or mm -hmm. uh, concerning one mission profile and um if you don't uh, uh connect this information uh, you can not compare it yeah but for the optimization what we are looking here when we uh, when you're looking uh, for how um systems can be better um then we have to look independent to those systems we want to improve power density on one end and the energy density on the other hand. So once we are talking only to the fuel system, it makes from the scientific uh, approach, it makes more sense to look independently to the both. It, it's possible. It is good in, in, in science if you can isolate the problems and you don't have to um, 
have the huge equations with a lot of parameters always at the same time on the table. Yeah. Yeah. So, Will, uh, Willie, I'd like to make uh, okay. one other yes, comment. Okay. Yeah. Is that, uh, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, uh, for instance, about what APIS is doing with the uh, their light aircraft development is that it's an example of an airframe which is being designed around a new kind of power plant. So if you look at all of the other efforts going on around the industry, uh, especially when it comes to larger regional aircraft, they're all uh, conversions of an existing aircraft that were originally designed for hydrocarbon fuel. And there's going to be always great difficulties in where to locate the, the tankage uh, from a structures and weight standpoint. Uh, but I think the APIS airplane is an example of some real clever thinking about how you would get some integration between the, uh, the tankage and the, the structural concept for the airframe. Okay. I, as you mentioned, you. The, the concept, which is a concept uh, of the I5, uh, I2, where you have the fuel tank in the spars of the of the wing. Um, mm -hmm. Don't you think uh, there is an issue when you have a crash that this could be uh, like on the certification side? It's a question to Philip uh, that this could be a problem because if you crash and you have this highly explosive uh, tank in there. Um, what are your thoughts about it? Or will it be so strong that it will, the tanks should survive the crash? Yeah, this is a, this is a topic that we will discuss until the end, of course. And uh, of course, it's dangerous to have um, high energy uh, containers in in vehicles, it doesn't matter if it is fuel or battery like in or normal, uh, like in a normal, or normal car. A hydrogen, exactly. And um, um, for this crash scenarios concerning to hydrogen, you can really look to automotive industry. And I just saw two, two or three weeks ago a crash test of a truck uh, with the hydrogen fuel tank mounted on the bottom. So uh, another truck crashed into. And uh, what happened was that the whole fuel tank was pushed through the through the steels and remain its shape. So um, they are so solid um, against uh, the rest of the structure um, that they do not crash with those standard crash scenarios. Of course, it does mean it is not crackable. Uh, on some point, it can happen, and um, and it will happen, and then there will be an explosion scenario, of course. And uh, but my standard response to that is, uh, you have also crash scenarios with fuel. Uh, most the biggest disasters happen uh, after the crash, normally when the aircraft is burning, and um, most people die during this um, uh, phase of the accident. And at least this doesn't happen with the hydrogen. It's uh, it's a short explosion and then it's done, and uh, that might be an advantage. Um, but of course, you're totally right. You have um, just explosive en energy due to the compression, and uh, if there's an explosion, you have to prevent that it hits uh, the passengers. But this is something that is possible um, to to okay. prevent. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, uh, one question to Mike, uh, because you mentioned that Zero Avia, which is you're looking at the larger aircrafts, and that at Zero Avia, you not only looked at the CO2, but mm -hmm. also at other factors, because I think this is going into the direction because people now are also talking, taking existing big aircraft, large aircraft with turbines, and then in the turbine, burn renewable fuel like uh, hydrogen or like other mm -hmm. renewable fuels created from hydrogen. Um, would then, if you say, okay, both take a zero uh, uh, um, emission hydrogen, then uh, a fuel cell aircraft would still be, have an advantage on the pollution side. Do I understand this right? So, um... You know, the idea of burning hydrogen as a fuel in a turbojet aircraft is actually a very old idea. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that even as long ago as uh, 1955, the U.S. Air Force 
actually flight tested a, a, a jet aircraft using hydrogen fuel. And they identified that one of the issues is uh, that uh, they uh, generated very large contrails uh, with a lot of water vapor in the upper atmosphere. And as you know, water vapor in the upper atmosphere is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So, uh, you know, some people have speculated that one pathway might be to start burning hydrogen in conventional uh, turbofan aircraft. And this would require quite a, a, a big change in the operational uh, aspects of, of the aircraft in terms of the uh, uh, altitudes that they're capable of flying at. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's quite logical to think that a first introduction for a, a Boeing or an Airbus might be a situation where you burn hydrogen in the main propulsion engines and you use hydrogen fuel cells for an auxiliary power unit for all of the other systems. And I think this is a technology uh, solution that, that's quite easily achieved. Uh, and in fact, many people have demonstrated, you know, various elements of this. And Rolls-Royce recently uh, tested one of their uh, turbofan engines on hydrogen. So there is a lot more research that's required. Uh, I think DLR and others are intending to use some of their testbed aircraft to look at the other uh, environmental aspects of, of uh, burning hydrogen at altitude. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's one of the good reasons having you in a discussion like this. It's like you also always can look at history. I remember this when talking with you, you you're looking at this already such a long time that there are some mm -hmm. things where some people think now it's very new. And then you realize, no, no, mm -hmm. they've done this already before. I remember we were talking mm -hmm. about ducted fans at some point where you also said, no, no, we tried this out already 20 years ago. And for <laughs> yeah. some reason, they, they are not working. So, um, yes. So I think, um, do we have? Uh, uh, Hello? Yeah. Is there any question from the audience? Perhaps at yes. the moment, let's see. Willie, can you hear me? Really? Yes, hear you fine. Yeah, hello. Can you see Hi. me? Yes, yeah, we hello. see you fine as well. Great. Yeah, I think it's more polite to, to face this side to you, right? So you can see me. Yeah, yeah. my name is Ethan and I'm uh, running a, a my, my company name is called Go Avia Goldstone Aviation. Uh, we are doing the certification consultancy in China. And uh, I have a news for you guys that CAC Air Weapons Department is now rushing to make the 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 <clears throat> the motor TSO specification and it will release very soon. And then they are also making the TSO standard for the, the, the China standard for the battery and uh, the battery management system and the controller. So probably they, because they want to catch up the, the trend, uh, the, the world trend. So they might maybe probably very soon they will have the hydrogen specification. And at that time, welcome you guys to come to China and join the market. And uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Mark Friend and uh, Philip. Yeah, I, I, I saw your, your introduction about your I2 airplane and uh, for me it's quite impressive. That is, seems like you integrate, you, you make the heavy tank into your, become part of your spa design, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, so, Ethan. You know this design, I think. Um, uh, you, you know Apus, uh, and uh, we know each other. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, thank you for um, for those news from the uh, Chinese authority. Mm -hmm. But so I, I have a question for you. That yeah. So does this soft, sophisticated idea can apply to the larger scale airplane? That's my question for you. And the same question for mm -hmm. Mr. Mike Friend because you you're. Mm -hmm. Your company is making the larger scale, right? Larger scale hydrogen mm -hmm. airplane. Do you think to either steal or buy the pattern from Philip? Good <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, go ahead. I think it, I think it's technically feasible, definitely. Uh, but the question is if it makes sense. And um, the um, what, of course, makes always sense in aviation technology wise is to use liquid hydrogen because the uh, uh, the energy density will be four times higher uh, compared to the best 
um, or to the optimum uh, uh, pressurized uh, gaseous tanks. The reason is the reason why we use the gaseous tank and the pressurized tanks is that the infrastructure of hydrogen is not existing at all at the moment at uh, and airfields, and we expect uh, that it will start with non-cooled uh, hydrogen mm -hmm. on all airfields. So. Um, we are forced um, to find solution with uh, with gaseous hydrogen. For mm -hmm. liquid hydrogen, the situation will be a little bit easier because the pressure is much lower um, and um, um, and the needed volume is uh, lower. And there might be also solutions um, for integrated fuel tanks, but they will look a bit different uh, from what we did here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike. Yeah, and, and I can add to that. So I, I actually saw some uh, analysis that, that Philip and, and his uh, people did at, at Opus that talked about uh, uh, how gaseous uh, hydrogen was, was probably a, quite a good solution for shorter range, smaller, lighter aircraft. But once you got to a certain size, uh, it made sense that, uh, that cryogenic hydrogen would be the solution. And, uh, you know, once again, there's a lot of history behind that. Uh, uh, as long as 20 years ago, the European Union uh, funded a, a series of, of studies called Cryoplane. And they looked at uh, the different applications of uh, cryogenic liquid hydrogen on bigger airplanes. And, uh, you know, when you start talking about an airplane that has a range of, of several thousand kilometers, it requires uh, quite a large uh, hydrogen tank. And if you look back to the, the cryoplane studies that were, were uh, published publicly, you can see that many of them had very large uh, circular tanks added to the top of an existing you know, A310 fuselage, as a for instance. I believe that was the, uh, uh, the baseline airplane for the cryoplane studies. So, you know, this location and integration of the tankage is going to be a, a big issue. And, and one thing Philip mentioned is that uh, when you go to cryogenic hydrogen, um, practically speaking, it means that the production of that cryogenic hydrogen has to happen at the airport. You, you really can't uh, create cryogenic hydrogen and then transport it uh, to the airport for larger aircraft. So there's going to have to be a lot of infrastructure development and, uh, uh, you know, frankly, a lot of, of, of energy sources located at the airports where this uh, cryogenic hydrogen is going to be required. Okay, we have uh, one more question yeah. from the audience, which is not directly, but... Right. Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, um, uh, several short, quick questions to uh, Mike, our uh, friend. Um, one is, uh, what is the power density of the current 600 kilowatts um, fuel, uh, fuel cell propulsion system used on the Donia 228 demonstrator right now? And the second is, uh, is uh, the Donia 228 a demonstrator going to try out liquid hydrogen? And the third is, mm -hmm. uh, is there any reuse of the thermal generated from the fuel, uh, fuel cell stack um, on the Donia 228 or such consideration in the system design. And the fourth is, uh, um, what is uh, the, uh, what do you think the benchmark of the power density um, for, uh, of the fuel cell for regional thin hole um, airline, airline use in the near future? Mm -hmm. Many questions. Many questions. Well, let me answer a few questions about the, the Dornier 228 test bed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, to answer one of the questions, no, there's going to be no attempt on that test bed to, uh, uh, you know, to recycle or reuse the, uh, you know, the thermals generated on board. The, the, the Dornier 228 will use gaseous hydrogen only. Um, and this is a, a test bed uh, aircraft to, to really look at the integration and operation of all of the different systems. So the, the, you know, the power and energy density of, of the systems on the, the Dornier 228 are, are not representative of what a, a production system would be. Uh, this system will be quite large and quite heavy compared to 
what uh, Zero Avia would propose as a production system, uh, but it's really being used as a, as a learning platform so that we can see how all of the, uh, the systems work together, uh, you know, what areas that we have to uh, work on with, with new technology. Uh, so we're, we're really not looking at establishing a, a benchmark for energy density or, or a, a, you know, specific performance. We're looking more at the integration of all the different parts and how they work, work together. Um, I have a quick question uh, because we have a little bit time because in our next session, uh, one speaker is missing, so we can uh, extend this time at this topic interests me a lot. And I think one of the reasons why I do these forums is I get all these people together and I, and I can ask my questions. And normally mm -hmm. people are interested in the what we do and we have our magazines where we then write about the questions and the answers. So um, one question would be, do you see, because the, the two aircraft, the two tryout aircraft are in UK, so they are in Europe. Is this correct? Uh, the, the, uh, the electric, uh, the, the, the six-seater was in UK, and also the Dornier is flying in your UK at the moment. Is this right? Uh, it is. Uh, there's actually a, a split operation. So uh, Zero Avia uh, actually flew two different uh, caravans, one in the United States in California and one in the UK. And the same is true for the, the Dornier 228. The airplane that's almost ready to fly is in the United Kingdom, but Zero Avia also has a Dornier 228 airframe in Hollister, California, that will be used in parallel for uh, developing the new technology elements that are uh, first being demonstrated on the hyper truck on the ground in California. Okay, um, because I have a question, do you see any chance, because at some point we were talking with them some time ago, having the, uh, the M600, the, the Piper uh, aircraft maybe flying, because theoretically it would be possible to, uh, to the aero, to, that you, we can have a hands-on on fuel cell aircraft as well. Do you think there is any chance getting them to come to aero uh, next year or the year after? Um, I, I doubt it only because they are so focused on getting towards the, the flight testing of the Dornier uh, 228 airframe. I think uh, it's, it's been a, uh, you know, a, a very long struggle to get ready for this first flight, and I, I, I don't imagine that they're going to be able to, uh, to take time to come to Aero. Okay, Sorry. good. Um <laughs> But mentioning Aero, maybe you have the chance to come over again, like in, uh, some years ago before COVID. And um, I know the others, I think um, uh, maybe we can just check. Uh, I think, Philip, you was at the Aero with the aircraft last time. And uh, are you tending to bring the, uh, the airframe again? Um, <clears throat> I think this year not, because of the same reason like on Zero Avia. Um, it's a big effort um, and to do so. So, and, um, But let's see what we can show in 2024. Okay. And Johannes, uh, I think we talked about it and you said uh, maybe you will be with one of the scaled aircraft and show uh, uh, around at Aero Friedrichshafen this year. Yes, we will probably bring our 50% mock-up and uh, show kind of the integration of, uh, so we are, we are working on a 50% on a scale flying prototype uh, towards end of next year. And um, yeah, we, we, we might be able to show a few interesting pieces. Okay, and Jonathan, uh, as we, there are like Rolls-Royce and you're located next to Rolls-Royce in UK at the E-Flight Expo, which we created together with the Aero Fair uh, more than 10 years ago now in 2009 was the first one. Is there a chance that we would also have a presence from Intelligent Energy because up to now, yes, we had some like you was, I think, uh, Johannes, you was flying over the uh, the DLR or now H2 Fly demonstrated this year to the Aero. And um, so uh, maybe we will see some more information from you and even some hardware at the Aero Friedrichshafen this uh, next year. Yes, uh, we're looking into those options at the moment, but uh, I think that we will be in attendance from, with, uh, from what 
what our original planning has looked like and having a look at that. Okay, that's great. Yeah, because we, 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 I always try to, to mix, and this is one of the reasons we have the forum in China, but we have speakers from UK, from United uh, States, and we have from Australia, from all different countries. So thanks again for being in the session this time. Um, and uh, yeah, we are getting ready for the next session. We will, if somebody needs information, we can connect you with uh, the uh, communication we received. And um, then I will send you invitations for our, uh, for our, uh, I, I see there is uh, Kalin who was one of our speakers yesterday. Do you have a question at this point? We. Oui. Yes, I thought. No, not, not yet. Up. And I know that you also worked on you also worked on, on uh, fuel cell solutions at some point. So maybe there uh, there is a question. No question. Some small comment. We follow this development uh, and seeing that for aviation, fuel cell has a great future future because the energy density is very high, and uh, there are different versions with gas gasoline. Hydrogen for small aircraft, for bigger aircraft, I think that cryogenic tank is the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And so we close uh, this session here. We keep you all updated when the next session will be. Next time I will try to invite you a little bit more early so that you have a better lead time. I apologize for this again. For Aero, we definitely can do it. And uh, we will report with our magazines, which we'll do about the subject we have here and also about the subject which will come up in the future. So stay tuned that you, if you're interested in hydrogen in the aviation, because I think it will have a great future and we need it if we want to get the climate change uh, slower because we can't avoid it anymore but for being able to live on the earth we probably have to reduce our emissions dramatically and their hydrogen will be one of the future solutions thank you very much thank you, thank you. how can you get to fly donald just scan the qr code on this page or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version, which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen, like a conventional magazine, or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.